a first down. Broken up. Stop on they damn throat and knock their ass out. Understand what I'm saying? Chargers bring some heat. Has time over the middle and it's picked up. Throwing right for the end zone. Henry caught. And Fournette is wrapped up. Hayward caught up the field. Eckler in the end zone. Touchdown. Chargers win. Chargers win. So our fans, let's work out now. Come on, let's go. If anybody got your back, I got your back. Yeah, for you sure. feel me? Hey, we about to go crazy. Dominate, it's in our hands. He grabs. What a catch wow. by Mike Williams. One-handed grab. Are you kidding me? Third down and goal. Wide open, an 84-yard touchdown. Car is brought down by Ingram. 45-50, touchdown, Charger. And that pass is broken up. Michael Davis moving, and he's going to be dropped. He's sacked. Joey. Bosa throws it to Keenan Allen wide open. Cuts back inside. Five touchdown, Chargers. Pocket holds up. Fumble. And the Chargers recover. 37 yards. Great concentration by the veteran. Here's Carr is going to be brought down with a sack. And that ball is intercepted. They can't cover him. Still on his feet. Touchdown. That is intercepted. There it is. He has dropped. He's got his block. Leaping in. Oh. Sideline into the end zone. Down. Excellent play, Desmond King. Knocked away by Hayward. Wide open is Hunter Henry. Trubisky goes down. It's another yeah. sack for Joey Bosa. Jump, caught, Keenan Allen. You know what time it is. Has Keenan Allen wide open to the end zone lead. Throws it out the side and the hit is made. By number 33 kicked off. Michael Davis. Here comes Ingram. Has him. Drops him. Shakes the tackle. That's a first down. Broken up. Stop on they damn broke and not there. Out. Understand what I'm saying? Chargers bring some heat. Has time over the middle and it's picked up. Throwing right for the end zone. Henry caught. And Fournette is wrapped up. Hayward caught up the field. Eckler into the end zone. Touchdown. Chargers win. Chargers win. So our fans, let's work out now. Come on, let's go. If anybody got your back, I got your back. Yeah, for you sure. feel me? Hey, we about to go crazy. Dominate, it's in our hands. He grabs. What a catch wow. by Mike Williams. One-handed grab. Are you kidding me? Third down and goal. Wide open, an 84-yard touchdown. We got a chance right now to do something special. Do Hard Knocks post show live powered by Pachanga Resort Casino. I'm Kirsten Watson. That is Matt Money Smith, and it is the season finale episode of five. Hard Knocks episode five. We did it, you know, five weeks ago. Anything could have happened. We're in this pandemic. We've seen the team go against, really against all, all the odds with all the COVID testing, injuries, everything that's going on. Money, tell me, what did you think of tonight's episode? Well, one, I got to be honest, Kristen, when you say we did it, uh, because I have three daughters, now I've got the Dora song, we did it in my head, and I feel like I have to <laughs> sing along like, we did it, we watched five episodes of Hard Knocks and guys got cut, we did it, we watched it. So certainly cuts are sad, right? I mean, it's a bummer. It's basically somebody uh, getting fired, and I'm anxious to get Tom on because I, I think you see how it can be handled uh, with class uh, and with understanding, and, and certainly Tom and, and Anthony did that. And um, unfortunately, I think the one takeaway is Derwin James and and just how uh, important he, he is to this team emotionally uh, from an energy standpoint, from a leadership standpoint. I mean, outside of the fact that he's probably one of the 10 best players in the NFL, if not even higher than that, with everything he can do on a football field, I, I think you see – you know, and, and I don't mean to kind of giggle when you hear it, but I think you just see the emotion from coaches and players in the moment like, oh, it's a cramp. It's a cramp. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me as a parent, again, just kind of pointing out that when the kid falls yeah. off the skateboard, you're like, oh, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I can mm -hmm. see that, you know, you're bleeding out your elbow and I got to put a compress on that immediately. But you're fine. Everything's OK. Yeah. And I think you saw that because of of what he means. Um, and, and I think how they feel about him personally, you know, as as an individual, as someone who loves this game, that has a passion for this game to see 
it taken away from him for the second consecutive year. Uh, it was very emotional for this team. I would have to agree. I think that whole scene, the buildup of just, you know, obviously coming off the injury from last year, doing so well in training camp. And then even with like, obviously we've been following the team. We knew what was going to happen. We knew how that scene ended, but it's yeah. still, it was a moment that was just like, it was like, it was heartbreaking. It really was. So it, yeah, it's always hard. And, to see and, that. And, and, you know, I think um, I, I can remember just seeing the Chargers tweeting out clips, you know, over the course of training camp and, and you know, and doing the radio show with Petros, who joined us for an earlier episode of, of Bolts After Dark. Um, there was just so much buzz from the football analysts, from guys like Brian Baldinger and Daniel Jeremiah, who just consume film of did you see Derwin covering Keenan? Like, if that isn't something that gets you ready for the football season, I don't know what will. And we got to see a little bit of more of that in this episode. Multiple routes by Keenan, you know, running with the linebacker. You know, you see the highlights of him just upending. I mean, straight decleating running backs time after time. And you just recognize what a special, special player he is. And um, again, it's it's football. It's 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 mm -hmm. a sport that, that does not forgive no matter how good. I mean, look, we saw it today with Von Miller, right? Uh, it does not matter how good you are. It, it no. can be a very unforgiving sport. Absolutely. And injuries come. And so we can only hope and wish Derwin yeah. a speedy recovery for next season. But we do have to, you know, we've been counting the curses all season oh, long. Yeah, we have. Each episode. Yes. So, you know, tonight okay. there was eight swears in total we are at 86 now yep you've got the little okay. monkey so that's 86 in total this doesn't include we should know it does not include week four because of course we gave it to isaac rochelle's local human right. organization so this is eight thousand six hundred dollars well, look at that so here's the uh here's the swear jar right here and uh i got a couple hundos that now have to get deposited <laughs> into there because uh we got the, uh, the eight, uh, you know what, whatever. Um, but there it is. A big thank you to our friends at monkeyknifefight.com because very cool. It goes to a great cause. As you mentioned last week, we did it with Local Human, with Isaac Rochelle, but all season long. Uh, we know how important the Chargers are in the community, uh, what they mean. So a, a big thank you to them. Uh, and again, the, the 8600 bucks to the Chargers Impact Fund is pretty freaking awesome. Um, Absolutely. and we know, you know, you sign up, you said it, and, and we've said it repeatedly. If you love to play, uh, monkeyknifefight.com, uh, play to mother scratch and win is what we like to say on this one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well guys, let's get into our clip of the week because we've got a special guest coming in right after this. What can I help you with? How can I help you become a better pro, a better running back? I think I have like a lot of tools in the bag and I need to learn how to unleash them. In order for me to help you unleash those tools, I got to help you become a better professional. Yes, sir. Now, you came into this gig 20 plus pounds overweight, my man. Yes, sir. You know, you, you know, we talking about paying you a six figure income and you, you know, I can't, I can't race with that car. Yeah. You know, so you got to take care of your body. Yes, sir. And then you got to figure out what type of vehicle you, you are, you know, you, you are F-150. Might be a 250, okay? okay? But you ain't no Corvette. You ain't no Lambo. So stop trying to run like one. Yes, sir. Big man like you, you got to stop trying to make 15 cuts before you get to the line of scrimmage. That's not your game, brother. You and I are going to get together, and, and we're going to watch tape, and we're going to study backs that you remind me of. So you start to get that vision of, of what it's going to take to be successful in this league. That would help me a lot. If I understand my abilities and see it, I could, I could take it and run with it. Right. You didn't make the active roster, okay? And you should be disappointed yes, because sir. you came here to make the team. But uh, all these coaches want to help you. I appreciate it. Are right, really you ready do. to go? Yes, sir. All right, man, let's do this. Put that mask on. Oh. Cut day is never easy. It's never fun. I mean, it was a scene in tonight's episode that some of these guys really have never been cut before. These are top talent athletes, but we have someone special who can tell us kind of the insides of what that is. So please welcome Chargers GM, Tom Telesco. Thank you for joining us welcome, tonight. Tom. How are you? Thanks for having me. Money, what are of you drinking course. there? Beer. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm drinking, a delicious cold beer. You caught me. I thought I was going to be able to pour it before the end of that clip, but it was so darn compelling 
I, I find myself <laughs> watching it for about the fourth time today as it is our favorite clip. It's so good. It's so good. But Tom, I have to ask you, what is it like, you know, being a part of a day like that in which some players' hearts are truly being broken, but also being challenged to, you know, take a new role with the team? Yeah, I mean, as for, for all of us here, coaches and, and for myself and the scouts, it's it's probably the hardest weekend of the year because you do you spend so many so much time with these players and even before we sign them or draft them, we already know a lot about them, know their backgrounds. Um, but then when, once we get them and, they're, and they work as hard as they do, they do everything we ask, like it's easy to release a player who doesn't do what you ask, right? But it's the ones that really, they work hard, they, they, take, the, uh, they take the coaching. And, uh, you know, this is a tough business. I mean, it's, it's hard to just, just make a practice squad. So you know how hard it is to make a 53-man 53, 53 roster. And for a lot of these young players, or probably every single one of them, they have never been on a team that they did not make, not in grade school, not in high school, not in college. And most of those teams, they were the best player on that team. So once you get to this level, to have to tell one of these kids that, you know, you're not good enough for this team right now. Now that may change down the road. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're difficult conversations. Um, but as you saw with Anthony's clip of, of good constructive criticism, not criticism, but yeah. constructive uh, coaching points of how to get better. And, uh, and all our coaches do that really well. Tom, I'd love um, for you to, if you could, I thought it was a really cool moment um, when you were talking to uh, a number of the guys about what their role was, specifically Braden, um, on, on, hey, you're going to be on the practice squad, but it also means you're on the scout team. So if you could maybe just share with the people watching sort of what it means to be on the practice squad, what your responsibilities are, um, and, and how that goes beyond just kind of waiting to, to get called up if injury or your performance deems that necessary. Yeah, you know, it's uh, they do everything the same as everybody else, um, except as of right now, they don't dress on game day. But it is a difficult job because uh, mostly the scout team guys, and it's also some of the active roster players, uh, they, they do serve as the scout team. So say for Braden's, uh, Braden's point, um, he'll be the, the, the Bengals defense. He'll play their two defensive tackles, whether, whether it's DJ Reader or Geno Atkins. So he has to mimic those guys, mimic their style, mimic the scheme. And the better they do that, the better, the more they help our offense. So he has that job to do. Then he also has to work on his own game and get ready to, to know our defense, know our scheme, know his assignments and get ready just, just in case he may have to come up and play this weekend. And, and then in the midst of all that, which, you, you know, what you didn't see on, on the, on hard knocks is uh, the practice squad is not a 17 week scholarship. I mean, essentially sometimes it's week to week. And, and, I, and I've told all the kids that, that are going to go in the practice squad, um, some you can't control. Your performance can control some of that. Um, you know, if you don't perform the way, way we would think or ex expect you to, then you may come off the practice squad. But the other side of it is, since we only have so many spots, there may be a situation where we have to bring a player in at a different position and we have to take a spot. And sometimes that spot is yours. And even though you've played as well as you could play, sometimes we have to move you off the practice squad. So it's, it's not like college where you're on scholarship and you're there. So it's hard working week to week. And even the active roster is the same way. That's not a given for 17 weeks for some of our players. So um, it's a tough environment to be in. So you have to be mentally strong as well as physically strong, um, but it's a tough job. Were there new challenges this year, just building out the roster? Obviously you did get the four extra practice squad spots due to COVID, but were there any new challenges that you saw this season? Well, I think the biggest challenge was trying to really evaluate the players the best we could not having preseason games. So, um, a lot of times in a preseason game, you can make some plays that kind of make some separation between maybe you and a player you're competing with, but mm -hmm. they didn't have those opportunities this year. So we had to try and make them in practice. And Anthony and the staff did a really good job of trying to put players in different situations um, just to help us evaluate them. Um, but it was a, just a, a new year for that, difficult year for that. But the good thing is that there are more jobs available. So now on the practice squad, you can still open some eyes here in practice and maybe some guys will move up after that. Um, I'd love Tom for you to, you know, and, and, and look, hard knocks is really good at what they do. Uh, they, they are able to find compelling characters that, that you become invested in, whether they're undrafted for you. I mean, year after year, someone comes out of hard knocks as, Hey, I'm rooting for that guy. And, and I don't think there is any question this year that that's Coach Lynn. Um, and, and maybe it's because he doesn't put himself out there. He's too humble. He, he never wants to kind of hog the spotlight from anybody else. But 
Um, if you could, as someone who's done this as long as you have at the different stops you have, if you could share with us just kind of what makes him different? Because he's certainly, and, and look, it may be because it's just juxtaposed against Sean McVay, who's just a different type of coach and a really good head coach. Um, but he just seems like he's different than so many other people that do that same job around the NFL. You know, he just connects with so many people here. And it could be anybody from, um, you know, our starting quarterback uh, to the, you know, the people that are helping clean the building right now with all the COVID protocols. He connects with everybody. And, and just, and, you know, what you saw in some of these clips, um, and, you know, he's a head coach, obviously. So the head coach is the CEO of the football team. He has to oversee almost everything. And it's a lot of administrative work. But when he's on the field, I mean, you see him over with the running backs, working with the running back, just like he was a running back coach. Um, he'll go down to the defensive group and give tips. I mean, what he does on the grass, what he does inside the building, it's, it's, it's a, this is a major job being head coach of an NFL team. There's so, there's so many different hats he has to wear. And um, no matter what goes on in the course of a day, nothing ever really phases him. You know, he, problems will come up. We'll discuss them. I'll ask him some different things. We come up with a solution. We move on. And uh, like I say, n- nothing really rattles him. And uh, in this business, shoot, three, four, five things come up every single day that you didn't anticipate is going to happen. And, and how you handle it is, is going to affect a lot of different things. And uh, between how he handles that and then handles a the football team on the field, uh, you know, we're, we're a lucky organization to have him. Absolutely. Now, I have to ask, I mean, you guys had, what, five to six weeks of cameras everywhere in your office at all times. What was that like? It was different. I can, I can <laughs> tell you that. It was, it was a different experience. Um, I thought our players and coaches handled it really well. Um, and, you know, for, for us, you know, look, I, I came up, my first year in this league was 1995. So I was brought up a different way. So the way we were brought up was you had the football team and then you built a brick wall around it. And then you kind of dug a moat around that. And you had crocodiles in the moat. So you just didn't let, you didn't let anything touch the football team. And, um, so as a GM, you know, I'm very protective of our players and coaches and staff. So when people come in the building that aren't us, um, yeah, I was probably a little tough on them sometimes. But I'll tell you this, they were great to work with. The whole staff, like you're showing right here, like the, the cinematographers, the audio people, uh, the producer, Shannon, they treated us so well. Um, we tried to give them as much access as we could. And um, it ended up turning out really, really well, hopefully for everybody that could see it on TV. Um, but they were, they, were, they were great to work with. And you know, there was a couple of negatives that went along with the show, but a lot more positives than the negatives. And, you know, one, you know, our whole country seeing, you know, Anthony Lynn as a head coach, that things that they don't see that we see every day, um, along with some of our players and everything. So, like I said, much more positive than the negatives. Um, you know, I get protective of the people here. I want to make sure everybody can do their job the, the correct way, the right way without cameras around. But you know what? NFL Films is so good at what they do. You do forget they're here and then their people are so good, so nice. Um, to work with that, you know, after four or five weeks, they start feeling like they really are part of us. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, it really was, you know, I was a little scared going into it and it worked out just fine. And I'm glad everyone can see, you know, what they saw the last five weeks. Uh, most importantly, uh, I would love to, uh, to know as a, uh, as a father of three kids, how does the Tom Telesco standing uh, sort of fare throughout hard knocks, seeing dad on TV and, uh, and how he comports himself in front of the cameras? Did you, do you feel like you gained? <laughs> so, did, did you move up in the rankings? Because we got Probably to see uh, uh, and the draft. The draft was so cool this year that we were in everybody's house and your kids were a big part of that. So kind of did you watch hard knocks together? Like what was the family sort of thing like? Uh, I, went, I went home early, watched the first episode uh, together with, with the family, but I haven't, not, not the others, but, um, you know, this has been a unique year because like, you know, no one could come to training camp. So my kids couldn't come to camp. They haven't seen us play. We have a brand new stadium that everyone loves that can't wait to see. And they haven't seen that. So I think, you know, for not only for, for my family, but for all Charger fans in this environment, to at least see inside of what goes on here you know in a year that you can't go to practice you can't go to training camp you, you can't go to a game so for us this is a perfect year to do this to see a little bit what goes on on, on the inside um i know in the first episode i i contributed i contributed to that swear jar so that's uh that's on <laughs> me whatever that amount is <laughs> but um yeah like i said it's, it's just been a unique year so it's a good chance for everybody to see what actually goes on here a little bit absolutely and a great way to get the fans engaged and excited because 
football's back. It's here. We've only got a couple more days before the first game, but I do have, we've got every week we ask the fans a question. So this is the Pachanga fan question of the week. We can bring it up on the screen. It is which rookie has stood out the most during training camp to you? Wow. You know, when people ask that, it's like asking which of your three kids do you like the best? <laughs> you know, you just, those are hard. Those are hard questions to ask. Um, you know, and I guess it shouldn't be a surprise. Our, our scouts were were uh, really high on on KJ Hill coming out of the draft. Um, you know, they had him ranked or or on our board much higher than where we took him. So you know, at, at some point, you know, the, the GM here almost made a huge mistake and didn't take him. But we got lucky that he was still there in the seventh round and were able to select him because they were they were banging on the table and banging my head, all, even though it was even though it was virtual draft to take him. <laughs> um, you know, KJ has done a great job. I mean, everything that you saw in college, we've seen here in training camp. Um, his polished routes, his, his quick feet, his quick hands, his really, really strong hands. He can make catches in a crowd. He just has a really good overall feel for the game that is that you don't usually see in a young player. So um, I don't know what his role will be for us this year, but I think he has a future in this league. And that, that's great to see from someone that was um, – you know, I know how disappointed he was to get drafted where he was, but you know, just getting an opportunity just to get in this league, it doesn't matter how you get in or where you get in, get in and make your mark. And he's made a mark with us so far. Uh, you know, and it, it, look, I'm not saying that, that Keenan, you know, falls in that same category as KJ, but you just gave him a big extension. Keenan's regularly mentioned as the best route runner in the league, one of the elite receivers. We, we know what Michael Thomas means to the, to the Saints. Um, you think about DeAndre Hopkins, who just is, you know, the highest paid non-quarterback there's one thing all those guys have in common and that's that they didn't run super fast 40s and to some degree they they slipped because of it you know whether it's late in the first or to the second or to the third what what do you make of trying to evaluate wide receivers and and maybe how much speed plays into that versus what you just said about KJ he's got the resume I mean he's the all-time leading receiver at a school like Ohio State so kind of what what goes into that and how much of a challenge is it in trying to figure out who's going to be great at the next level Hey, just real quick, nothing against KJ, but some of those Ohio State receivers left early, so they didn't have a full four years yes. of production. But <laughs> anyway, but no, so look, you, you love speed in every position on the football field. Um, you'd love to have it. Um, and receiver, it, it is a pretty critical part of the position. However, if you don't have top, top elite speed, you have to really be exceptional in some other areas. Okay, so, um, and one of them usually is just separation quickness at the top of the route. Um, whether man coverage, zone coverage, you have, you have to separate from people just to get enough to get open, um, to have a feel with your routes. It's kind of like being a, a point guard in basketball to be able to see what's going on around you to find the open area. Some guys have that, some guys don't. Um, Keenan obviously has that. I think KJ is going to have that too. Um, and just have that toughness in hands. I mean, the one thing you can't drop balls in this league. Um, doesn't matter if you're fast or slow, but if you're not going to have elite speed, you got to kind of, uh, click off all the other boxes, but it's separation, quickness, route running, um, discipline, route running, hands, adjust to the ball, and then run after catch. And, uh, you know, KG also has some, some return ability too. So, but those receivers you mentioned, they all have that. And um, yeah. like, you're, you're not going to have every single trait you'd love in every position. So some of them have to compensate for others. And uh, if you don't have speed, you got to have everything else. So true. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Season finale, Hard Knocks. We are lucky to have you. So thank you for taking the time out of your evening to hang out with us. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank Kirsten. Get home. Thanks, Money. Cheers. Of, of Cheers. course. So, Money, it's now time. We've got Polling the People, of course, presented by Monkey Knife Fight. The question is, who was the MVP of the season? The people said, See? Coach Lynn. That's kind of what you, do you I agree? Again. I feel it. <laughs> Are you okay? I did it again. I, I knocked the, uh, the monkey bobblehead down again. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> I, maybe, maybe this is my first beer. Maybe it's my you fourth. Had, I don't know. Mm, that's not for the I camera. Like it, it wasn't on camera. On so that's up to you to figure out. Uh, I did not know what the results of that poll were when I asked, uh, when I asked, you know, Tom about Anthony Lynn. And I, I don't think there's any question, you know, and, and again, I think it's also because He's not someone that seeks the case, not a moth to a light. You know, there are some coaches that are like that, that, that want to put themselves mm -hmm. out there and be stars. And that's not coach. He's, he's business, man. But if you get a chance to know him, like he's just great a dude to hang out with. So I don't think it's any surprise at all that, 
yeah, someone who's who's a high character individual, a leader of men, and and was you know shown and, and a spotlight was put on him, and and basically he was just himself. So that does not uh, does not surprise me at, at all. I think the Fajoko is totally understandable because we have to see his family, mm-hmm. and you get to see you know how emotional the sport of football is, and and I think it speaks to kind of what we're going through right now, you know, with college football in a number of conferences being limited, and these young men who have worked toward this, you know, three or four years of their life and trying to make their dreams come true, get taken away from them. Um, And you just see how much it means, how it's not just Braden Fajoko. It's mom, it's dad, it's sister, it's brother. It's a family investment when it comes to this level of football. So not surprised to see him up there uh, as well. Well, they do say football is family. And I mean... Yeah. I may have shed a tear when his mother started crying at the end. Always <laughs> a beautiful scene. <laughs> but yeah. let's bring in our next guest, Michael Badgley. Welcome to the show. I have to ask you, I thought you were going to be a breakout star in this season, but who do you think did. was the MVP? All right. First off, how are you guys doing? And can you hear me? <laughs> we can yes. hear you. Yes. Cool. All right. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> and to your point about getting on the show, well, yeah, I didn't even get like a second, a millisecond, uh, anything no. in time. What on happened? Hard Knocks. <laughs> I don't what, know. Like, what happened? <laughs> uh, I guess I guess I was just in the wrong place. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get anything. Were you talking to the producer, to so the cameraman, like, "Hey, like, I'm ready for my close up"? Was there any of that, or it just? Well, you know, there was one scene where they never showed, but it was Isaac and I. We had our gym down in our garage, and I thought that was a for sure. Well, that was going on to, you know, kind of kick the season off, but that wasn't anywhere to be found. Uh, So I guess that just left a uh, sour taste in my mouth and I just didn't talk to him since. (laughs) I think if it were, I think if it were last year, you, you know, you would have had a a bigger, I mean, cause you know, cause it's, it's all about the the journey, right. And, and how, and granted you're, you weren't even really there last year. So I, or two years ago, Um, but I, I would love for you to speak to that, Mike, because you know, you did have an interesting path. You get picked up by a team uh, that's got one of the best kickers ever in front of you. So you kind of know, and, and that was Adam Vinatieri in Indianapolis when you first got your career started. So you kind of know like, okay, this is probably not where I'm going to end up. So what is that like being in a camp when you're behind arguably the greatest kicker in the history of the NFL? Um, you know, you kind of sit back and, you know, you still go into that uh, environment, you know, trying to win the job. Uh, you know, ultimately in the back of your head, you don't even really tell yourself what's uh, truly going on, uh, you know, with Vinny being there. But I also just took the opportunity. I'm like, listen, you know, I know I'm going to get some reps in a game. I know they'll give me a shot as long as I do well in practice. Uh, so I kind of just took, you know, every day that I was given an opportunity uh, to not only learn from what Adam was doing at practice, uh, but to just take advantage and go out there and kind of prove what I can do. And now I do have to bring this question back because I know before Hard Knock started, you guys, had, you did a teaser. You had projected that Joey Bosa was really, you were going to see his personality shine. But who do you think was the standout of the show? Oh, the standout. Uh, you know, to me, you know, there was, I'll start off by saying there was a lot of guys they missed out on personalities. But I think the star of the show chargers wise other than coach lynn i'm gonna have to go with leasy because i found myself uh coach john lott my bad for people, <laughs> listeners who don't know uh because every time he came on camera i was truly laughing and what's funny is you know some guys might put on for it uh but that's just kind of who his personality is i loved uh coach lott and uh coach phil the receivers coach i mean i thought i thought that was electric uh, anytime they showed his scene, when he, whether he was going off on guys or telling guys how it really is or just him having his fun personality on the field, I thought he was uh, uh, the star of the show as well. There, there, yeah, are, uh, there are coaches around football that just have a million of those, you know, quote worthy. You see them on a wall or on a motivational yeah. poster. It feel, it, look, and it's the way it's cut up, right? And obviously it's entertaining. But is that, would you say that that's Coach Lott, that he's just got a thousand of those ready to fire off at a moment? What yeah. you do in the dark and shows on the light, boy, you know, is, yes. is he that guy? <laughs> exactly. He's got one, he's got one ready to go every day. It's like they're just something, <laughs> something you learn new every day with his sayings. I'm not going to lie. You had had a mo- oh, I'm sorry, Kirsten. <laughs> no, no, no. If, no, if I was you had say, a mullet, coach- I, it, just, it just popped in my head. When you had your mullet, 
that probably would have fared well for you this year if you had if you had been <laughs> rocking like if you had embraced your inner jersey combined with the University of Miami and it was like mullet and you're rolling into the lot in like a 78 Camaro with T-tops or something like that. I think that very well would have helped your cause. Oh yeah. Roll, roll into like training camp, like Rick Vaughn and major league. And kind of just make <laughs> exactly. <a> exactly. <laughs> that would have, well, been, your, you know that would have been your moment to shine. <laughs> Speaking of mullets, they missed out. They I don't even think they got a glimpse of Dan Feeney's beautiful mullet that he's got going on our <laughs> offensive lineman. <laughs> oh, is that right? Dan Feeney's got a killer mullet. That thing is looking and he's, clean and, and he's a push beautiful. broom stash guy too. Oh, so he's, does I'm he, telling yeah. you, he's he's got the look going and he's rocking it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I was just gonna say earlier that I think Coach Lynn comparing Darius Bradwell to the Cars. I was like, I feel like this is a Coach Lot moment for some reason. Like that to me was like his kind of like, I got it too. Like I can do this, but yeah. definitely so good. But Badge, I have to ask you, what are you, look, season's here now. What are you looking forward to most this year? You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what our team can do. Um, you know, you, you look at it from practice and, and it's tough. You know, everyone says it, you know, it's tough without having a preseason or any of those tune-up games. Um, but you have to realize every team's kind of going through that. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of this with COVID going on, uh, you know, it kind of was my theory in my head was, well, the more responsible team is going to be the one that comes out on top, right? Because you don't know who's going to go down which week or what, what's going to happen. And, you know, I think, you know, I think a lot of people are, you know, betting against us, right? You know, so I think it's one of those seasons where I think we're going to turn a lot of heads and we're, we're going to be, one of those teams that just each week we're, we're going to knock them off the notches and it's just going to, it's going to be fun to see us kind of develop into that season. Uh, you'll start the season uh, with a particular team. If I, if I were to tell you uh, December 9th, 2018, you would, uh, you would say what? If I, if I just throw that date out there, <laughs> December 9th, 2018. What do you mean? Wait, what did we do that day? Well, you may have it stumped was, him. What, do, you, do you know what happened on that day? Do you know oh, what we're happened on about, that? We're talking about Cincinnati the, 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 Bengals. Exactly. The 59-yard field goal. There we go. And and now tell us, as, as we have now gotten to know uh, Coach Lynn, <laughs> did you have to sell him on sending you out there at the end of the half to attempt a 59-yarder? And how hard, if you had to, did you have to, or did he just say, Badgley, get in there. Like, how did that, how did it play out that you had your career long and one of the longest field goals in NFL history kicked in that game? <laughs> um, so the situation was kind of like, you know, I'm still a rookie, right? Just kind of keep up and shut up. Um, and I'd so wind it down to the half and usually getting ready for that two minute drill uh, type deal. We were in scoring uh, position, but I remember it was right around, it was a 64 yarder and then there was a penalty. Now I was standing maybe like five yards away from coach Lynn kind of looking at him to see if he's going to give me the nod to go, go in there for the 64. Uh, and then I, I saw him just kind of nah threw his hand out there. We'll go for it. We'll shoot. Then they get a jump off sides. Right. I think. And then we uh, gained a couple of yards and coach Lynn kind of looked around. He's like, you got this. I go, yeah, I got it. Just ran, just ran out there. And, <laughs> uh, we took a shot and it was, it was great. It was one of those uh, welcome to the NFL moments for me. 59 yarder at freaking zeros <laughs> granted it was at the end of the game and a game winner but still end of the half you, you end up putting the team up uh i think it would end up putting them up a couple i don't know i think it was i don't remember but uh i think it was almost it a touchdown it made it like a touchdown yeah yeah, yeah it and it gave you momentum because that was a tough game they had um what's his name was uh driscoll was the quarterback he was running all over driscoll the place was it was dealing. a nightmare yeah, exactly. And then, uh, I think we closed it out with like uh, what was it, a two point conversion stop at the end there. Exactly right. Does that sound right? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, it ended, it ended up being a uh, I think it ended up being like a five or six point. But that was a tough game. And I remember I was doing games with not to just get on stupid rants that don't matter. But <laughs> I was doing games was with uh, with Marvin Lewis, with Coach Lewis for the Alliance. He was uh, my color analyst when I was the play by play. And he and I went out to dinner one night and we were talking about that game. And he's like, I'm telling you, money. 
that's the game that got me fired. We win that oh. game and everything <laughs> changes. It was so you contributed to a man being uh, out of a job. I think he's now he's now in. I think he's at Arizona State with Herm Edwards. So he's fine. He landed on his feet. He's, he's doing all right. But uh, sorry, wild tangent slash aside. But uh, just thought of. I want to make you know what that was for, Badgley. That was to point out that you kicked a fifty-nine yarder in a football game when you were a rookie. There we go. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it just look. We said it. Football is back, guys. It's officially kickoff week. We're here. I feel like against all odds, we did this. So, Michael Badgley, thank you so much for joining us for Hard Knocks Post Show Live. I'm Kirsten Watson. That is Matt Money Smith. And then, of course, the Money Badger, other way. I just feel like I love that. Money and the Money yeah. Badger. Like, how could I Do not it on Sunday. That? Make it a 60. Make it a 60 That's or a 61 it. on Sunday. That's it. Thanks Absolutely. for having me on, guys. Of course. Absolutely. All right, Chargers fans. Sunday, you know what to do. Tune in. Thank you for joining us.